Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney. And this is Caffeinated Crimes. Welcome back. Hope you guys are doing well. When you guys are hearing this, it's going to be the week after Thanksgiving. So I hope you guys had a wonderful, happy, safe Thanksgiving. Hopefully our Thanksgiving has gone smoothly. I don't know. That is to be determined. Um, We'll find out about it in a couple weeks, I guess. But Yeah, hopefully you had some good food. Um, hopefully you stayed safe. Hopefully you don't have COVID. Yes, hopefully you didn't don't. fight with anyone too much. You know, all that. I mean, it is the holidays. I'm sure you had a fight with someone. Hopefully it wasn't terrible. So Yeah, it happens. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you guys got some delicious food. Um, if you guys are Patreon members, you got a special bonus episode on Thanksgiving because we are so thankful for you. And we also talked about our ideal Thanksgiving plates. So if you guys want to hear some cool-ish, I don't know, some are bad, but some are funny, um, Thanksgiving crimes and what Courtney and I like to eat for Thanksgiving, you can head on over to patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes and check that out from last week. Yeah, and you only have to go, like, the smallest tier, and you get them all. And we have, like, other ones. Like, we talked about Skidmore, Missouri. That was a good one. Um, Our Jacqueline's husband and my fiancé were on an episode, and it was, like, us talking over each other the whole time, but it was fun. Yeah, four Um, people is a lot. (laughs) (laughs) It's a lot to edit. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, if you want to see our faces, have a Google Hangout every month with us, like, come on. Doesn't that sound fun? I mean, that sounds fun to me. Sign me up, Courtney. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> I just pay Courtney every month to be on the podcast with her. <laughs> she pays me to be here. <laughs> also, before we got started, I was thinking about how, you know, we spend the first five minutes or so of every episode bullshitting after we have spent the previous 30 minutes bullshitting before we actually start <laughs> recording. So, Courtney and I get on the phone and we're like, oh, bu- bu- bu. and then we're like, oh, and then one more thing, and then one more, and then all of a sudden it's been 30 minutes, and then we finally start recording because, you know, we have a lot to talk about because it's not like we text 24 7 or anything. <laughs> so, it's always like, okay, what banter do we have for the podcast? Okay, well, I'm not going to say this on the podcast, but let me tell you this, and let me tell you that, and let me tell you this, and then we're like, Oh, wait, we ne- we didn't come up with any banter. Yeah, so. all we did was talk about the things that we can't talk about on the podcast, but nothing <laughs> that we actually can talk about on the podcast. So Yes. So I guess you just get us telling you about things that you can't hear about, so you're welcome for this intro, I guess. But if you want to hear about them, come ask us about it on the Google Hangout every <laughs> month. We'll tell you there. We just don't want to tell the, the masses. Oh, because there's so many of you guys out there. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> Hopefully we'll look back in like two years and be like, remember when we joked that we had so many when we had like none and now we have like millions of followers? That would be so nice. Um, That would be really nice. Oh, what the fuck happened? So before Courtney and I started recording the podcast, I was like, you know what? If someday we happen to make it big in the podcast world, you know, the money's going to be great, but I really just want fan art of us. Like, that just seems like Mm -hmm. the ultimate, like, made it goal. And then this week, um, if you guys listen to Morbid, so Ash tweeted about Starbucks, and Starbucks tweeted back at her, and I was like, Courtney, I have a new goal. (laughs) So. (laughs) (laughs) That's your new goal. Yep. Just in life in general, you know, not even related to the podcast. That's really just all I got going for me. <laughs> so, But we would love fan art. So yes. if you are an artist and you just want to draw something, please do. I would love to see it. Oh my gosh. Like cartoon versions of Courtney and I, like there's nothing in the world that would make me happier, y'all. Just please let us know if that's something that you can do for us because we would yes, love please. that very much. <laughs> Just make me pretty. Don't make me ugly. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I am vain. Make me pretty. (laughs) I've seen some fan art that I'm like, that's an interesting interpretation that I'm not sure I would send to someone (laughs) of themselves. (laughs) Like, I'm just like, you, you made that person a lot uglier than they really are. I don't, and it's not, and it's not like it's a, like that they just aren't artistic. Like, you can tell they're very talented, but I'm like, that was an interesting choice on that nose and that cheekbone there. <laughs> so, And maybe that just goes back to how, like, everyone's brain is different and people maybe see other people different than we you do. You know, that's true. Like, what if, like, that's just the way the person actually sees them and we all see people differently? 
I got way too deep. That's a good real point. Quick. That's a good point, Courtney. <laughs> you know, you got me there. That was very true. <laughs> now that we've had our little banter, hope you guys liked it. If not, you can skip it very easily. Um, yeah, you guys know where the real episode starts, so you yeah. you know how to get there. It's, it's fine. fine. Um, it starts here, skippers. <laughs> Make that like 15 <laughs> seconds <laughs> long so they know. Um, but yeah, as you can probably tell by the episode's title, we are doing the infamous Bonnie and Clyde today. Yes, this one was a special request by arguably our number one fan, who is my dad. Mm-hmm. So you're welcome, dad. This is for you. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> yes. And let me tell you, it was so fun to research because while I knew Bonnie yes. and Clyde, there was so much I was like, damn, I didn't know that. And It's like everyone knows the general story, but then there's like so many details that I'm like, I had no idea. Which also kind of makes me remember how much I love like old-timey outlaws so if you guys like this i will do babyface nelson i will do billy the kid jesse james whoever i'll do them all all because they fascinate me and it's so cool yeah it's just like so interesting to research so please let us know if you guys enjoy this style yes era i don't know what you want to call it you know what we you know what we mean if, like, you oh were God. at the Alcatraz East Museum in Gatlinburg and you were in the section of, like, old-timey outlaws, any of those, that's very specific <laughs> and only, like, a handful of people will get that. But, anyway, <laughs> on with the show. So, our references for today, we used um, a few biography.com articles, the FBI website, a history.com article, and good old Wikipedia. <laughs> Yes, I did use some Wikipedia for this. However, the Bonnie and Clyde Wikipedia page is full of resources. So, you know, we are very um, hesitant when we use Wikipedia, but I did, you know, cross-reference everything, and they do have a whole list of amazing books that historians have written and all kinds of good stuff. So definitely check out the Wikipedia page and all of their sources. Yeah, that helps definitely with the older ones and the bigger cases. Um, Like recently when we did Ted Bundy, it helped a lot because Mm -hmm. it would talk about it and it would reference like, okay, the Anne Rule book on this page. And I was like, perfect, I can go to this page and make sure it's accurate. Like, so it can be used for good, but also bad. So just, you know, we've talked about it before. Just keep your eyes open. (laughs) So Clyde Champion Barrow was born on March 24th, 1909 in Teleco, Texas. And I'm going to interrupt you already just because I want to say it's very fitting that my dad recommended this episode because it's my dad's birthday. Obviously not 1909, but that's my dad's birthday. Anyway, continue. Sorry. Ooh, that's really (laughs) cool. I was also thinking, I feel like you just have a very famous or infamous life set ahead of you if your middle name's champion. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Like, you're just, like, setting up, like, you got to do something big. (laughs) High standards. (laughs) have to be remembered and he was <laughs> oh he was he was the fifth of seven children in a very tight-knit family um the family was quite poor and their family farm failed due to a drought and so they eventually moved to dallas texas so clyde attended school until the age of 16 and he had ambitions of becoming a musician and so he learned to play both the guitar and the saxophone as a teenager he also attempted to enlist in the u.s navy But apparently he had lingering effects from a childhood illness. Apparently they're not sure exactly what it was, but they think it might have been malaria or yellow fever. So they did reject him based on his medical issues. And it was a really tough blow to him, and he'd already had USN tattooed on his arm. It's a bit premature there, Clyde. (laughs) Also, like, USN, like you're not even going to write the whole thing out. (laughs) Just bare minimum. nope. So, under the influence of his older brother, Buck, Clyde turned to committing crimes. So, he began with, like, petty theft, and then he started graduating to stealing cars. Uh, His first arrest was in 1926, when he was 17 years old for not returning a rental car that he'd gotten to visit his girlfriend in Dallas. So, he tried to keep it, and you can't do that, guys. Even back in the 1900s. Yeah, no, you you gotta... You gotta take them back. And also, I was like, they had rental cars in the early 1900s? Who knew? Yeah, and they had a system where they knew. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like back then, like, with getting on a flight, it was like, hi, my name's John Smith. <laughs> and they're like, all right, cool. <laughs> all right, so, see you later. Interesting. <laughs> 
Uh, three weeks later, he was arrested with his brother for possession of a truckload of stolen turkeys. He wanted to have a good Thanksgiving. I mean, um, he was ready to go for the family Thanksgiving. He was. I mean, he came from a big family. You gotta have a lot of turkeys. I don't know. One turkey will not do for seven children, okay? <laughs> so, from here, he quickly escalated to armed robbery. Um, and by late 1929, at age 20, Clyde was a fugitive from the law and wanted for several armed robberies. In January 1930, Clyde met a 19-year-old waitress named Bonnie Parker. They were a mutual friend and was immediately smitten. Now, Courtney, do you mean the Bonnie? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> what if we just told you a whole bio of a different Bonnie? And then it's like, and that was not the Bonnie. And then three years later. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding, guys. Different Bonnie. <laughs> he had a lot of smitten Bonnies. <laughs> um... No, but Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born on October 1st, 1910 in Rowena, Texas to Emma and Charles Parker. So she did have an older brother and a younger sister. And when she was four years old, her father passed away and her mother moved the family to an impoverished suburb of Dallas known as Cement City to live with Bonnie's grandparents. So Bonnie attended the local schools there and she was a very bright student. She was very interested in poetry, literature, um, she earned honors in all of her studies. She even wrote a lot of, like, poetry, um, and she would continue to write poetry until the end of her life as well. So she had a small stature, and she was thought to be exceptionally pretty, and she had dreams of becoming an actress. So during her second year of high school, Bonnie started dating a classmate named Roy Thornton. So in September 1926, just days before her 16th birthday, they got married. Because child brides, you know. Like you do. Yep. <laughs> um, and Bonnie even... Those child brides. <laughs> I actually know someone who got married, like, when they were in high school, who was, like, my age, and they're still together and very happy. Oh, wow. Wow. Good for and them. And they had dated since, like, fifth grade. Wow. So, anyway. Good for them. <laughs> Side note. Because um, I always, like, randomly, like, check up on them, like, oh, yay, they're still <laughs> together. Like, love exists. Anyway. <laughs> Don't you love when that happens and you're like, oh, good. Because then sometimes you're like, oh, no, they got to. And it just, like, breaks your heart. <laughs> like, yeah. Bonnie even got a tattoo of their names on her right thigh to celebrate their romance. Like you do. So clearly when Bonnie loves, she's just all in. She's like, zero to 100 real quick. <laughs> However, the marriage was not good. And Roy even became physically abusive. Um, so their relationship soon fell apart, but they never officially got divorced. In 1929, Roy was sentenced to a five-year prison sentence for robbery, and Bonnie moved in with her grandmother. Bonnie and Roy never saw each other again after this. So Bonnie and Clyde quickly fell for each other, um, but their romance was quickly interrupted when Clyde was arrested and convicted on multiple counts of auto theft. So Clyde didn't want to be in prison, obviously. <laughs> he does. <laughs> and he immediately, was, <laughs> he immediately was like, how do I escape? How do I get out of here? So, as we said, Clyde had fallen just in love with Bonnie, his number one, his ride or die, he was ready to give her his all, and he was like, I gotta find a way to get back to her. Um, so both of them were feeling very lovesick, being apart, and to the dismay of her grandmother, Bonnie agreed to help Clyde, and she smuggled a gun into prison for him. I mean, I guess that's love. Which, I'm also wondering where she hid it. Oh, you know <laughs> Oh my god what if you shot up into your hoo-ha i mean anyway. it's been i remember a news story like a couple years ago about this lady that smuggled a gun in in her vagina and i'm like that's like that just seems very uncomfortable that's very dedicated um that yeah. is a level of dedication i do not have to my fiance so no nope. kudos to you guys yeah um also with the whole like plan of escape and just the time of this all i could keep thinking like while researching this was oh brother where art thou yeah. <laughs> like, definitely. it feels like that time, so. Yeah. Um, on March 11th, 1930, Clyde used the gun to escape with his cellmate, but they were caught a week later. So Clyde was sentenced to 14 years hard labor, eventually being transferred to East Tim State Farm, where he was repeatedly sexually assaulted by another inmate. Clyde did end up murdering his rapist by crushing his skull with a pipe. That would be Clyde's first murder. However, another inmate who was already serving a life sentence admitted to this crime so Clyde wouldn't get more time. That's a real friend. I mean, that's a good, yeah, that's a good friend. They're like, eh, I'm here for life anyway. I'll say I did it so you can go. 
I never want to justify killing someone, but it's not like he just like randomly <laughs> picked someone. Like he had a reason for targeting yeah. this guy. So maybe the guy was like, I got you, dude. I understand. Don't yeah. do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but Clyde would do it again. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler. So while Clyde was serving his time, him and Bonnie stayed in contact and soon again, Clyde thought about escaping. So in an effort to be relieved of the hard labor and get paroled, Clyde had his big toe and another toe cut off in an, quote, accident. I mean, I've known a lot of people that have done a lot of things to get out of work. That, that tops them all. That's, pretty, that's some dedication right there, Clyde. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and so as a result of this, he would walk with a permanent limp. And most of the time when he drove, he also had to do it in socks because I guess the whole with his foot couldn't really get it right. Mm -hmm. Um, But unfortunately, what Clyde didn't know was that this whole scheme was unnecessary. Uh, His mother had already convinced a judge in his case to grant him parole. And he was released two weeks later in February 1932. Imagine going to the trouble of cutting off your toe so you don't have to work in prison, and then you're like, oh, actually, you're getting out in two weeks, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, that would be so infuriating. Like, <sighs> are you kidding me? I cut my toe off. <laughs> like, um, so once released, he was reunited with Bonnie. So he was like, I'm gonna try to get a job. I'm gonna abandon my life of crime. I'm gonna be like on the straight and narrow. And so he worked at a Dallas glass company but police harassment caused him to lose his job, so Clyde said fuck it, gave up, and formed a gang, and resumed his criminal activities. There you go. He started with robbing grocery stores and gas stations for a small amount of money, um, and their goal was to earn enough money to launch a raid against the prison where Clyde had been raped. And Bonnie did join the gang in April. Clyde and his gang then started a series of robberies of small businesses and banks, and Clyde even killed a police officer and a store owner in one of his robberies, which then made him a very highly wanted man with a large price on his head. So Bonnie did go to prison sometime in 1932 after a failed hardware store robbery with another member of the gang. Um, And while she was there, she wrote 10 odes entitled, Poetry from Life's Other Side, including one called The Story of Suicide Gal. She was only there for a short period of time before being released because the grand jury did not indict her. The other member of the gang was sentenced to prison from this robbery and never returned. So on April 30th, Clyde was arrested for being the getaway driver during a robbery where the store owner was murdered. And then in late 1932, a young gentleman named Raymond Hamilton began traveling with Bonnie and Clyde. On August 5th, Clyde, Raymond, and another member of the gang named Ross Dyer were drinking moonshine at a dance in Oklahoma when the local sheriff and deputy approached them in the parking lot. So, logically, not logically, they murdered the deputy and left the sheriff severely wounded. And this would be the first of nine police officers that Clyde and his gang would murder. They really, really loved to kill cops. Yes. (laughs) Really, really loved it. (laughs) So Hamilton decided to leave a few months later and was replaced by William Daniel Jones, and he would kind of go by W.D. The day after joining the gang, W.D. Jones and Clyde murdered a man named Doyle Johnson to steal his car. A few weeks later, they would murder another police officer when stumbling into a police trap that was set for someone else. That's just bad luck. I'm like... I feel like at this time, like, police just set traps, like, on every road, and they were like, we got, like, 20 people we need to catch. We got to catch one of them. Right. Like, we'll just, we'll just, we'll get one of them eventually. It's fine. And then on March 23rd, 1933, Clyde's brother, Buck, was released from Texas State Prison after he'd received a full pardon from the governor. So he joined Clyde and brought his wife, Blanche, with him. So the gang embarked on a series of very bold robberies, which even attracted national news, which if you think back in the 1930s is a big deal because there's not the 24 hour news cycle. (laughs) Like it's pretty, pretty big if you're making national news at this point. Definitely. So in the spring of 1933, they're like, all right, let's maintain a low profile. Like maybe this will people will forget, you know, don't need to be too bold (laughs) at this moment. (laughs) Clyde, Bonnie and WD lived with Buck and and Blanche in Joplin, Missouri. So if you're on the run, I feel like the first place people are gonna look is at your family's house. Yeah, probably. 
you know, like, I feel like if I murdered someone and I left, they're going to go to my parents' house, my sister's house. Like, they're going to look there. Yeah, they're, they're going to look to places that, you know, you have a safe place to go to first, so. Just a thought. Not that we're giving advice, you know, on where to go if you're <laughs> on the run from the law, but, you know, maybe pick somewhere more inconspicuous. Yeah. So, the gang did end up holding loud parties late into the night and drinking heavily, which again, not, That's not laying low. That's not laying low. <laughs> so, neighbors got kind of suspicious, and so the police showed up thinking bootleggers were living and operating in the home, and a shootout ensued. Two officers died, but the gang did get away. However, they left behind a roll of film that contained pictures Bonnie and Clyde had taken together, along with Buck's parole paperwork and a poem Bonnie had written. Uh, Those pictures were published in newspapers around the country, including details of what they'd done. And a lot of these pictures are what we see today, you know, kind of pictures of them on the car, them with like, I think there's one with them with guns, stuff like, Mm -hmm. that's where they came from. They'll be on the Instagram, guys, don't worry. Which just makes me laugh. They're like, huh, we're on the run. Let's have a photo shoot. Like, how are you going to get those developed? (laughs) Right. (laughs) So the gang just continues robbing banks from Texas to Minnesota over the next few months. And they would often kidnap police officers and civilians to get away and would let them go far from the site of robbery. So kind of like take them very far away. And sometimes they would leave them with money to get home. How courteous. Yeah. How nice. <laughs> They're like, we don't, we're trying, to, we're just trying to, you know, get away. We don't really care. Yeah. We don't want to hurt you. You know, here you go. You can get home. <laughs> and they were now having to avoid hotels and restaurants since their photos had been published so widely and many people were now looking for them. So on June 10th, 1933, they got in a pretty severe accident where Clyde missed a detour sign indicating that the bridge was under construction. So the car did smash into a barricade going 70 miles per hour and sailed through the air before landing in a dry riverbed. So acid poured out of the car's smashed car battery and severely burned Bonnie's right leg and even burnt down to the bone in some places. Like, oh. So as a result of the third degree burns, Bonnie now also walked with a permanent limp for the rest of her life. And sometimes it was so bad she had to, like, hop on her left leg or she'd have to have Clyde carry her. Which, it's amazing that in the 1930s they all survived this terrible car crash. <laughs> like, there weren't safety yeah, mechanics. Yeah, like you're flying through the air. Yeah. Crazy. So they did end up getting help from a local farm family to tend to Bonnie's injuries. Then they kidnapped the local sheriff and city marshal and then left them tied to a tree with barbed wire. So... And I couldn't find anything about why. (laughs) Like, I just found that they did this, and I'm like, what what was the intent? I don't don't understand. What was your reasoning here? Yeah, like, I don't know. They just loved, like, kidnapping and, like, Like, stuff. And it's so weird, too, that they would, like, randomly let some people live and then, like, kill others. Like... Yeah, I don't understand that. I don't know. It was crazy. So the gang was constantly evading the law, but law enforcement kept making more and more intense efforts to capture them because, I mean, they keep killing police officers, they keep tying them to trees with barbed wire. Um, and so the gang stopped and rented a cabin in Iowa in July of 1933, and the group of five were loud and rambunctious and paid for all their meals and coins, which stood out to the owners. Again, nope, not doing a good job. Not keeping that. a low profile here. So they went to the local town to purchase snacks and bandages and atropine sulfate for Bonnie's wounds. And the man working at the drugstore was suspicious um, because he had been warned to be on the lookout for someone buying items to treat a burn. And he called police who followed the gang to the cabins. So on July 29th, the police a bit surrounded the cabins and a shootout ensued. Like they do. (laughs) Again, like how are you surviving all these shootouts? Right? Like... So, the gang managed to get away and hide in an abandoned amusement park nearby. Buck had been shot by the police and was severely injured, and locals noticed the group caring for him and contacted police, who came to the amusement park where another shootout ensued. (laughs) This time, Buck was fatally wounded, and Blanche was shot and captured. So, they would spend the next six weeks robbing banks from Colorado to Mississippi, and later, W.D., who was frequently mistaken for Pretty Boy Floyd, was captured um, in November of 1933 in Houston, Texas, by the sheriff's office when the gang went to visit family, and so Bonnie and Clyde just went on together. So, another thing, like, I told Jacqueline when I was, like, researching is, like, how crazy a time it must have been, too. Like, 
you're being told to like be on the lookout for like this car or these people. But if you like drive past them down the road, you don't have a cell phone. Yeah. So you're literally going to have to keep driving until you find somewhere that has a phone. So like by the time you call the police, you're like, I don't know, they went this direction like an hour ago. Like it would have been so easy to evade the police, I feel like. Because then by the time the police get there, it's like, okay, now another hour has gone by and who knows where the hell they are. Okay, this was helpful. And I don't, uh, I don't know when 911 was officially instated, but I don't think it was at this point. So I feel it like was, you'd have to call yeah. like another, you'd have to try and find like the number of the sheriff of, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it'd be like a big like process. I'm pretty sure, don't hold me to this. I'm going to need to look it up, but I'm pretty sure 911 was implemented nationwide after the Kitty Genovese murder, which was in the sixties. That's what I'm thinking too. It was like but, 60s, yeah. So I don't think at this point they would have had it. Yeah, so it looks like 1968. So yeah, we're a good like 30 years off from that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just remembered that it was a big issue with Kitty Genovese because it wasn't so easy for someone to just call in. We should do that case. There's a lot of misconceptions about that case too. We'll do that. Anyway. Don't worry, guys. It's on the list now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, on November 22nd, 1933, a trap was set by the Dallas, Texas Sheriff and his deputies in an attempt to capture Bonnie and Clyde near Grand Prairie, Texas, but they escaped the gunfire, once again, like they do. (laughs) Um, So then, again like they do, they held up an attorney on the highway and took his car, which they abandoned in Miami, Oklahoma. And then on December 21st of that year, Bonnie and Clyde held up and robbed a citizen in Shreveport, Louisiana. So then on January 16th, 1934, five prisoners, including Raymond Hamilton, who was serving sentences totaling more than 200 years, were liberated from the East Ham State Prison at Waldo, Texas by Bonnie and Clyde. So two guards were shot by the escaping prisoners with automatic pistols, which had previously been concealed in a ditch by Clyde. And as the prisoners ran, Clyde covered their retreat with bursts of machine gun fire. In this escape included Henry Methvin, who would later become a part of their gang and travel with them. And so police were now adamant that this gang be captured and killed. So the Texas Department of Corrections reached out to former Texas Ranger Captain Frank Hammer and asked him to be a part of the group pursuing Bonnie and Clyde, and he agreed. So he was the third former Ranger that they spoke to because the first two were too hesitant to shoot a woman. So they're like, "Uh, nope, I can't pursue them because I can't guarantee I'll kill them when the time comes to it. So at least they were honest. <laughs> yeah, right. But good old Frank's like, I, I got you. I got no problems. <laughs> I'll kill that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm a 1934 feminist. I mean, equality all around. Okay. <laughs> she shooting us. I'll shoot her. <laughs> she ain't no fairy princess. All right. <laughs> so on April 1st. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to make a terrible April Fool's joke, but I won't. So, since this one is able to be a little bit more lighthearted just because it happened so long ago, I'm just going to say here that at this point, we've edited out about five minutes of uncontrollable laughter because (laughs) this happens occasionally, guys, where we just can't get it together. But I was going to make a terrible April Fool's joke, but I'm not going to. But then I did, so Courtney could hear it, and then I just couldn't get my act together. So... (laughs) This happens a lot, too, when, like, you're like, okay, do not laugh. (laughs) Whatever you do when you say the sentence, do not laugh. And it just makes you burst out laughing, and you cannot control it. It is so bad. And then it's because the last time you read the sentence, you busted out laughing. So now, as you're reading it again, now you just have those words (laughs) associated with laughter. (laughs) I think there was one time in one of the episodes where you had to completely omit a sentence because you were like, I can't say it. Yeah, I did. I was like, I can't. (laughs) I had to, like, completely change that whole paragraph around because I just couldn't get through that one sentence anymore. (laughs) So on April 1st, Bonnie and Clyde encountered two young highway patrolmen near Grapevine, Texas. So before the officers could draw their guns, they were both shot. So the Texas governor and a highway patrolman both offered rewards for the bodies of the Barrow Gang. So on April 6th, the gang fatally shot a constable in Miami, Oklahoma. And they then kidnapped a police officer who they also wounded, but they did leave him on the side of the road with some money. So I guess that was nice of them. I find it odd too, because they keep coming back to the same places. You know, like this is where they left the car. And I'm like, 
I feel like if you've already done this once and you know that you're wanted nationally, do not go back to the place where you've already done something. Yeah. The like, U.S. is pretty big. You could, uh, and, like, you could clearly, expand. They were all over the U.S. because they robbed banks from Mississippi to Colorado. Like, I think they came out east at one point. So you have options. So why are you going in the same places? So then the FBI gained jurisdiction, finally, but only on the fact that they were transporting a stolen car. So none of the other charges were federal offenses, but the stolen car was. I think they are now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think if you kill, like, a police officer now or somebody, like, sheriff, I, whatever. I think we mentioned this at the end, but I think it came from this case. I think those laws were changed. Oh. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah. So the FBI followed every clue and every lead trying to find them. They implemented many wanted posters that had their fingerprints, pictures, descriptions, criminal records, and other data, and distributed them to every officer in the country. So the agents followed a lot of leads, particularly in Louisiana. So once the FBI realized their connection to Henry Methvin, and that his family lived in Louisiana, they found out that Bonnie and Clyde were driving a stolen car in New Orleans. So we got lots of connections around the same place going on. So on April 13th, an FBI agent obtained information that placed Bonnie and Clyde in a remote section of Ruston, Louisiana. So the home of the Methvin family was not far away, and the agent learned of the frequent visits by Bonnie and Clyde. He also found out that they were traveling back and forth between Texas and Louisiana, sometimes with Henry. A group of FBI agents and police officers from both Texas and Louisiana now joined together in the hunt for the Barrow Gang. So with this new information, the FBI decided to concentrate all of their efforts on capturing Bonnie and Clyde. So they learned that they had thrown a party at Blake Lake, Louisiana, which is hard to say, <laughs> um, on the night of May 21st and were due to return to the area two days later. So on May 23rd, they were driving down a Louisiana back road when they saw Henry's father standing by his broken down truck, so they stopped to help him. What they didn't know, however, was that police officers were waiting for them. Um, so Henry's father had betrayed them because he was able to get leniency for his son by doing so. So he was in on this setup. So the police then opened fire and Bonnie and Clyde were killed instantly. So Bonnie was 23 and Clyde was 25, which this was one of those things that I didn't realize about Bonnie and Clyde was just how young they were. Like they have done all of this up until this point before the age of 25. Like, yeah, crazy. It is crazy. So there were 112 bullet holes in their car. <laughs> like, they were like, we're for sure making sure that these guys go down. Yeah, they were not. They were like, every single bullet you have, fire it. <laughs> yeah. Which, like, at this point, they've been in how many shootouts and they've gotten away. So I, I get it. Yeah. Um, so there was a statement from one of the police officers that was present that said, quote, each of us six officers had a shotgun and an automatic rifle and pistols. We opened fire with the automatic rifles. They were emptied before the car even got with us. Then we used the shotguns. There was smoke coming from the car and it looked like it was on fire. After shooting the shotguns, we emptied the pistols at the car, which had passed and ran into a ditch about 50 yards on down the road. It almost turned over. We kept shooting at the car even after it stopped. We weren't taking any chances. So, like I said, they were just like, nope, these guys are going down. I mean, there's at least, what, like, four shootouts that they, yeah. like, escaped from? Like, I get it. <laughs> when they're killing police officers this whole time. Yeah. Um, so, officers inspected the car afterwards, and they found a ton of weapons, ammunition, and 15 stolen license plates from different states. So, by the time of their death, Bonnie and Clyde, obviously, were very famous people. So, a lot of people tried to get souvenir makers at the scene by attempting to make off with locks of their hair, pieces of their clothing, oh, and one of Clyde's ears, you know, no big deal. Just, just an ear. Yeah, so people were just Which like... Which, how can... My thing is, though, you could go cut some random person's ear off and be like, it's Clyde's right. ear. <laughs> like, how are they gonna know? They're like, okay. <laughs> so it was just, like, swarmed with people trying to, like, be a part of this historic event. Um, so the car was towed with their dead bodies inside, to the local furniture store slash funeral parlor because those were often the same business. Buy your casket, buy your couch. It's a one-stop like, shop. Yeah. You're going to buy your furniture your whole <laughs> life and then you're going to buy one of the caskets. And then you're going to buy your death furniture as well. Yep. So, um, so this small town had a population of 2,000 people 
and they attracted an additional 10,000 people shortly after the news spread that Bonnie and Clyde had been killed here. Um, so the police officers who were a part of this were promised around $26,000 each as they would split the reward money. But many of the people who originally said they would contribute to the reward basically backed out and didn't. And so each officer only received about $200 each, which would be the equivalent of about $4,000 today. So in order to make up for the money that they did not receive, the officers took souvenirs from the car, some of which they later sold. Um, Clyde's mother wrote to police requesting that they send her his guns because he had never been convicted of these crimes. And she's like, look, it's not fair for you to like keep his weapon. I'm like, he died shooting it, y'all. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> but, and there's no record of them ever responding to her or sending the guns back. So their bodies were eventually returned to Dallas and they wished to be buried side by side, um, but they were buried in separate cemeteries, mostly because Bonnie's mother did not approve of their relationship, and so she buried her daughter separately in Dallas. And 20,000 people attended Bonnie's funeral, and flowers were sent there from strangers all across the country. <laughs> so she was just well-known. I don't even know if it's well-liked or if those people just wanted to be a part of this. I don't know. Which is weird because, I mean, and I don't know if it was just, like, a different mindset back in the day, but I feel like now, like, I've seen comments on news articles where people shoot police officers and people yeah. are mean. So I'm like, it's yeah. so weird that people were, like, coming to her funeral and bringing flowers after they killed, like, so many police officers. Yeah. Like, it it's was... like such a weird shift in, like, Definitely. the nation. Yeah. So, Clive was buried next to his brother Marvin under a gravestone that read gone but not forgotten, um, and they did have a private funeral for Clyde. So, after the shootout, the police determined that the car should be returned to its original owner since Bonnie and Clyde had stolen it. So, it was returned to Ruth Warren of Topeka, Kansas. And she's like, I don't want this now. It has 112 bullet <laughs> right? holes in it. What am I supposed what am to I do gonna... with this? I'll tell you what she did with it, Courtney. <laughs> Um, other reports, however, do say that police tried to keep the car, but Ruth sued them and they had to return it. So I'm not sure, you know, a long time ago, sometimes reports get muddled, so who yeah. knows exactly what happened. Um, but Ruth eventually sold the car to Charles Stanley, who toured fairgrounds with the car, and the mothers of Bonnie and Clyde in tow as side attractions. <laughs> So weird time, guys. It's a weird, weird time. Very weird. Um, so the car is now an attraction in the lobby of Whiskey Pete's Casino in Prim, Nevada, which is a small resort town on the California border about 40 miles south of Las Vegas. Which I have um, hesitancies about like killer memorabilia, but I don't know. I would. I feel like I would go see the Bonnie and Clyde car, you know? I think I would too. It just... And, I'll be honest. And I don't know, and maybe it's because it feels less real because it was so long ago, which sounds bad because obviously everyone they killed were still people that deserve to be respected and remembered, but just something about the different time makes it feel less icky to me for whatever reason to, like, go see the car, you know? I wish it was, like, in a museum or something. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Where it's more, like... It's less like an like, attraction, yeah. and it's more like we're here to show you like what happened and like yes, make it like a part of history and yeah. not like an attraction to make money at a casino. Yeah, that yes, hundred yeah. percent. So as we mentioned earlier, during the summer of 1934, new federal statutes made bank robbery and kidnapping federal offenses. So now the FBI could have pursued them for these charges as well. And then in February of 1935, 20 family members and friends were arrested and tried for aiding and abetting Bonnie and Clyde. And all 20 either pled guilty or were found guilty. Um, both of their mothers spent 30 days in jail. And Clyde's teenage sister was sentenced to one hour in jail. So well then. I guess it's sort of like matter of principle, you got to get your time in too. Yeah. So Blanche was permanently blinded in one eye during the shootout and was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but was paroled after five years for good behavior. So she lived a very calm life after this and did eventually remarry. Um, so Warren... <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but for some reason, like my head jumped ahead, like when I was like reading along with you and I thought you were saying she married Warren Beatty. <laughs> I don't know why. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> You're like, that's a weird twist of events. I was like, what? <laughs> anyway. 
So Lauren Beatty asked to use her name in the 1967 movie Bonnie and Clyde, and she agreed to the script, but she reportedly was not happy with how she was portrayed in the final version of the film. Um, and Blanche did die of cancer in 1988, which is crazy because obviously Bonnie and Clyde were so young when they died, but it just seems like a completely different time from like the 30s, the late the, 80s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think of how much she lived through, though. Because she, she was obviously around, like, I don't know how old she was during this, but, I mean, the Great Depression probably just happened. So then she's living mm-hmm. through World War One and World War Two. Yep. And, like, the Vietnam War and all this after she was in, like, a gang that killed people. <laughs> and she can't see out of one eye. And then she's just like, life is weird. What a life, man. <laughs> so other inmates that Bonnie and Clyde helped escape from prison were captured and sentenced to death in the electric chair. And W.D. Jones was captured by police, and basically he gave various tales of his, quote, imprisonment by Bonnie and Clyde. So he's like, I wasn't a part of this gang. They held me hostage. Okay, sure. Um, He did also hint, yeah, okay, okay, W.D. Um, He did also hint that Clyde was bisexual and that all three of them engaged in sexual acts together. So maybe the gang was also having an orgy. I don't know. Hmm. Um, so he served 15 years for the murder of Doyle Johnson, um, and (laughs) in a strange twist of events, like everything here, um, Jones was murdered by the jealous boyfriend of a woman he was trying to help in 1974. That is, all these take, like, weird turns, like the people who, like, survived, yeah. Yes. Um, so Methvin was convicted of the murder of the constable, and he was paroled in 1942 and killed by a train in 1948. So, some say that he was drunk and stumbled onto the tracks, and others say that he was pushed onto the tracks in an act of revenge. Um, And his father was killed in a hit-and-run accident in 1946. So, basically, if you had anything to do with the Barrow Gang, you were cursed. Yes. Um, (laughs) So, Bonnie's husband, Roy Thornton, remember him, they never got divorced, so this was still her husband, um, was sentenced to five years for burglary in 1933 and was murdered by prison guards in 1937 when he attempted to escape. So as we know today, Bonnie and Clyde are heavily romanticized. Um, there are films, a Broadway musical, a TV miniseries, and lots more. Um, the car used in one of the movies is on display at the Alcatraz East Museum in Gatlinburg, as Courtney mentioned earlier. Yeah, I did bring that up. Um, yes. It's pretty cool. That museum also has the White Bronco from O.J. Simpson and oh. uh, one of Ted Bundy's Beetle cars. Interesting. So, um... Yeah, it is very interesting and kind of weird to just, yeah. like, look at it. It's like, I don't know how I it's feel like about this. Weird vibes. The weird white vibes. Bronco's a little different because there's nothing that happened in the car. But, yeah. like, Ted Bundy's bug, it's like, oh. oh. Yeah, I don't I don't love that. So, as we mentioned, Bonnie and Clyde were not good people. Um, they were bank robbers. They were kidnappers. They were murderers. They murdered innocent people and police officers. But for some reason... They're still remembered fondly in this, like, Bonnie yeah. and Clyde kind of way. It's like, I want to love, like, Bonnie and Clyde. No, like, that's your, like... you don't. <laughs> you know, until the end of time. Like, no, they literally, like, murdered people. They stole from people who were just trying to make a living. Yeah. They brought a bunch... I mean, look at what happened to everyone else in the Barrow Gang. Like, it's possible that they were even killed by other people because of what they did. Like... Yes. It was not as romantic as we need... To make it out. They were just two kids who were in love with each other who just, like, murdered people. Yeah, this is not a romantic story, guys. Um, So two weeks before their death, Bonnie had given her mother a poem that she wrote called The Trail's End that finished with the following verse. Someday they'll go down together and they'll bury them side by side. To a few it'll be grief, to the law a relief, but it's death for Bonnie and Clyde. And that is the story of Bonnie and Clyde. Which is so interesting because there were so many details I didn't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think I knew how many people they killed. I knew they robbed and stuff. Yes. And it's just crazy how romanticized it is and how everyone is like, Bonnie and Clyde. And that's couples, like, Halloween costumes. And they say, you know, there's songs about it, you know, and stuff like that. So it's just crazy. You know, hearing, like, the full details and stuff. Yeah, like, my dad recommended this case after he was watching the movie, so now I'm going to have to talk to him about the movie and, like, what what did they portray. So, basically, once this episode comes out, we're going to have to have a conversation about the actual story in the movie and see what things they included and what things they didn't, what things that they romanticized, as I'm sure they did for the sake of Hollywood, 
you know, it'll be interesting to see what the what their take on it was. Yeah, definitely. All right, so Courtney, what is your perk of the week? Okay, my perk of the week um, is going to be the show Seinfeld. So. Oh, interesting um, choice. Seinfeld is Kevin's brother's Sean. It's his favorite show, like, of all time. Like, he absolutely loves, always has loved Seinfeld. Um, like, he'll make references to it that we never get because we don't watch it. <laughs> so, basically, with COVID and us being quarantined, we've been watching a lot of shows. Um, and usually, like, we'll try to take our lunch break at the same time and, like, watch an episode. Like, we'll go on a walk and, like, watch an episode mm-hmm. while we eat. And so, that is our new, like, 30-minute show we're watching. And it's actually really funny. <laughs> it's nice. really good. Um, some of it's a little hard because, like, they reference things that I'm like, okay, clearly I don't understand because... I wasn't around in the 90s. You know, they reference people (laughs) or, like, things happening. But it's still really funny and it's really good. And it's been a nice, you know, comic relief of... Yeah. Since there's so much, you know, hard stuff in the world at the moment. So (laughs) it's been nice to just kind of sit down and watch something funny in a time where it wasn't as horrible as it is now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've never seen that one. But I've heard it's a really good one. So maybe that's one I'll have to add to my list to check out one day. You can definitely see, like... How I Met Your Mother and, like, Friends, like, all that, how they, like, really based themselves off of Seinfeld. Yeah, because, <laughs> you know? I mean, because it was kind of the first, like, not the first, but, like, it was half hour, mm-hmm. like, funny sitcom kind of. You know, single people living in New York and yeah. in an apartment, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah. I feel like a lot of shows really based off of that, so it's really cool. Yeah. Cool. That's a, that's a fun perk of the week. Yeah. Um, Jacqueline, what is your perk of the week? So, my perk of the week, Courtney... <laughs> Mm-hmm. which is so weird to say this out loud and on the podcast, but at the time <laughs> that this episode has been released, we have told the world that we're having a baby. So Woo-hoo. that's my perk of the week, which has been my perk of the week for many weeks, but, you know, couldn't really say it until now. Um, and by we, I do mean my husband and I, but we also kind of know that pretty much means Courtney too. Yeah, <laughs> so. like I'm like the third, not like sexually, just like... <laughs> emotionally mostly with Jacqueline so you know it's like I didn't make it but like I'm gonna help raise it so yeah but like I'm basically there too (laughs) yes exactly um but yeah so that's my perk of the week that yeah it's so exciting too because there's so many like things about the podcast like we've joked about like (laughs) off air you know what I mean like it's very funny because Jacqueline is a little out of breath, and so when we're editing, <laughs> you can kind of hear her breathing. <laughs> um, there's yeah, been many it's... weeks where she's been like, can we please record this at a different time? Because I'm about to vomit, and I don't want to yes. vomit in your ears. <laughs> yes. There's been a couple of times where I've, like, stopped mid-sentence, and I'm like, okay. And Courtney's like, please just take off your headphones first. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's all I ask. <laughs> she's like, I just don't need to hear anything. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, the podcast has been a challenge the last few weeks. Um, Courtney has lovingly and dedicatedly, if that's a word, um, taken on a lot of research on days where I'm like, <laughs> I just didn't get out of bed today. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Hey, it happens because I'm sure someday I will be like, I can't do anything right now <laughs> except whatever. I don't know. Yeah, Whatever that so... future thing is. <laughs> but hopefully now that we're in the second trimester, things will be a little bit easier. But, you know. And maybe we'll Jacqueline's perk of the week next week will be that she knows the sex of her baby. We're going to know if it's yes. a little baby girl, a little baby boy. Um, that will be the perk of the week next week because oh, I hope we well, know by then. Actually, we're recording it tomorrow, so it depends if we find out tomorrow oh, or not. That is true. <laughs> so it may in the not next be the... coming weeks, stay tuned. <laughs> yes. So in real life, within the next week... Um, hopefully my doctor will be calling Courtney to give her the results of the sex of the baby. Yes. So Courtney can then order cupcakes for Andrew and I to open together. So. Yeah. It'll be exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's what's been going on in my life since I'm trying to think of what episode we found out on, but. You don't remember. <laughs> I think, I want to say it was Krista Pike. I want to say we recorded Krista Pike the day after. That sounds right. Yeah, some, somewhere around those yeah, somewhere few around episodes. But, but if you yeah. want to put in your guesses on is Baby Powers a oh. baby girl or baby boy, 
Um, yes. Do so on Instagram at Caffeinated Crimes Pod, um, on Facebook at Caffeinated Crimes Podcast, at Twitter at Caff Crimes Pod, that's C A F Crimes Pod. Um, you can send us an email if you want to do it that way, uh, Caffeinated Crimes Pod at Gmail, or if you feel so inclined to donate and help fund baby powers, <laughs> it's <laughs> patreon.com slash Caffeinated Crimes. Hopefully, I'll remember when I post this, maybe I'll make a separate one and have like a little question, you know, like, you can do a poll, you know, like which one, girl, boy. You know what I'm talking Courtney's, about? Yes, Courtney's doing a lot of fingers are going motions. on right now. <laughs> but you can do all of that at the places I just said. <laughs> yes, like Courtney said, go to all those places to talk to us about everything. <laughs> Is it a Bonnie or a Clyde? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. I had to do it. It came to my head and I had to say it. You know, we're going to Google it after this, but I'm sure someone has done a gender reveal with that. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> People do some weird shit for gender reveals, Are you guys. missing like... toes or is your leg permanently burnt? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, man. Oh, boy. It's not okay. funny. It's... I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. So go do all of those things. But in the meantime, go have a cup of coffee. And don't commit a crime.